Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Legends with Ravi. I'm your host Khalid Moedin, and this is Cricket Fanatics Magazine's Legends with Ravi. So, as you know, this is where we talk to legends of the game, and today we've got another special guest with us, David Callahan. So, I'm very excited about this one. Um, we we don't get to talk to legends very often from this decade, and when we do get an opportunity, we really want to take advantage of it. So, without further ado, let me introduce to you first with a an amazing soundtrack to come into as a tribute to the late Chadwick Bos Boseman. Ravi. Love this song. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fitting that you picked it. Because, I mean, with everything that's happened now in the last week with regards to Chad Bos Chadwick Boseman, passing away and obviously with the whole Black Panther um, not having that opportunity but us both being Marvel fans of course so uh, that's quite interesting that you picked that the particular song um, do you want to just maybe go in before we talk about our guest are you back you there yeah yeah I'm here can you hear me perfectly? Are you right? Valid. Yeah. Okay, so we lost him. <laughs> so Ravi will be back. Um, so obviously, like I said, we're going to be talking to a major legend of the game today and um, someone that's really close to a lot of Proteas fans' hearts. We've got Ravi back. Ravi, we just want you to give a quick um, intro into the, our guest today. No, absolutely. And uh, sorry about that. The power literally just went off. So I have to get an alternative Wi-Fi source. I'm in my vehicle at the moment as uh, the the um, audience can quite clearly see in a ridiculously cold evening here in Johannesburg. It's supposed to be spring, for goodness sake. Um, <laughs> absolutely. So a little bit of context of the song as well. We, we chose uh, the uh, Black Panther soundtrack, of course, with the recent passing of Chadwick Boseman. Uh, one of my favorite actors ever. Um, he happened to be a big fan of Black Coffee, funnily enough. But um, mm. we'll certainly go down uh, that rabbit hole in a more convenient setting. Uh, very passionate about South African music. Loves his quieto as well. There was an extensive part of Kendrick Lamar's soundtrack that we've just heard now. But uh, a little bit on our guest. Our guest is certainly, well, as far as I can tell, isn't a fan of quieto. Uh, but he is a uh, significant member of one of the initial squad members of the Proteus team in the early 90s. He played under Hansi Kronje, of course. He's one of the, the most prolific uh, all-rounders that have come from the Eastern Province Jumbos, uh, which is one of the most formidable teams in the domestic setup. He's also the older cousin of uh, Justin Kemp, which will unpack a little bit more. I mean, it's clear that that family is uh, blessed with many uh, uh, God-given talents uh, in, the, in the game of crickets especially. So we'll certainly unpack that with him. And uh, we, uh, in the midst of telling a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, in, in, the general, in, the, in the world of journalism um, about this interview tonight, uh, they have sent some tributes and some uh, positive messages that uh, they have asked me to sort of uh, extend to Dave as well during the interview. But yeah, I'm um, very excited about this. Um, uh, looking forward to getting into it. Cool. So without further ado, let's introduce our guest. There's no theme song for him quite yet. Maybe on his second appearance, we'll have one. So <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the show, Dave. Evening, guys. Thanks very much for that intro. Um, yeah, it's been a uh been great to be involved with such a great game for such a long time and uh you know i'm just happy to to be on your show and i've listened to a, a quite a few a couple of them um and uh it's great to see people like yourselves promoting the game because i think we need it at the moment yeah absolutely absolutely dave out of interest sake uh, i don't know many southern kings fans but are, are you a southern king fan by any chance you support eastern province extensively yeah, look, I mean, obviously, um, I don't know if you recall, uh, in, the, in 1997, 98, um, yeah, I played, I actually played rugby for Eastern Province. I played, I was 10 to with Donny Gerber and another oh, guy, wow. Gary Lust. Yeah, so I had a, I, yeah, I had a first year of rugby. Um, I just, uh, I, I, yeah, it was quite a, 
quite an interesting story. I finished school, had a, a year at Sussex, um, first first up, um, which was organised for me. Then I came back to to Port Elizabeth, and um, I was quite keen to 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 continue playing. But my father was quite said to me, I I needed to go and either study or go to university. So I decided that studying was going to be a better option, uh, and I didn't last there for very long. Um, before I had to go to the go to the army, so I went to the army and then realised that the only way to get out of this is to play rugby because um, those guys in Kimberley, uh, where I went to do my national service, um, loved their rugby. So I started playing rugby and I ended up playing for Griquas, uh, what they call a, the the Kudus team, which is the second team. Um, and in in that team we had Gary Teichman, uh, Henry Coxwell, and a couple of guys in that team as well. So we had a, a reasonable side. And, and we loved playing rugby. And then um, Kepler arrived in Port Elizabeth and then wanted me to come back. So I came back to the Port Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, I came back to Port Elizabeth uh, uh, and I started playing uh, rugby and cricket. And eventually uh, Kepler one day said to me, look, uh, um, cricket's going to, uh, 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 rugby's going to injure you. And um, and that's how I ended up. I, I actually ended up playing rugby for dispatch. Can you believe it? Uh, with Donny Haber <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a really, really good rugby side. But, that's a um, very impressive yeah, CV. I, that's a, it's very yeah. impressive. I must say, though, and I, um, I, I, you, yeah. you actually form part of a unique list of mine now because um, <laughs> I'm a bit of a sports, uh, sports nut as well. As you can see, I've got my Springbok cap on at the moment. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You form a part of a list of, uh, of cricketers that I know that uh, played both cricket and rugby uh, at, a, at a professional level. Dan van Sale, yeah. Errol Stewart, uh, and of course, uh, if you go across the, yeah, no across the ocean, Jeff uh, Wilson, of course, played for the All Blacks and New Zealand. Um, yes. So not many of the youngsters would, might be aware of that. Yeah. And there was um, also, you remember Caravan Cobbler played? Um, there, there was, a, you know, there been a couple, there have been a few, um, and there have been a couple in Port Elizabeth as well. You know, Adrian Burrell, whose uh, father, uh, his father played. Uh, Jeff Dakin played. Um, yeah, you know, so Ethel McKinnon played. So there have been Gavin Carley played. So there's about five or six of us in Port Elizabeth that, that did both, you know. So it was it was different. I mean, I recall playing in the Nissan Shield semi-final in Durban. And then the following weekend, putting the, the, the red and black stripes on and playing against Border. Down in Island, down in Island, and in a friendly game, one, one, one from one week to the next. You know, that's how that's how we change seasons. So <laughs> yeah. uh, and then a week later, I'll that, that's my, crazy. Down in Cape Town. But that's crazy. I mean, I know the Eastern Cape is known for its, uh, many athletes, especially in the rugby space. Uh, Chad Alcock, I and mean, of course, you remember Dion Kayser uh, played extensively yeah. for the Sharks in Eastern Province uh, as well. So some fantastic. Uh, guys that have come from that part of the world. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about your cricket. Um, of course, uh, you come from a wealth of cricketing talent in the family. What, what are Christmas dinners like? Is there a game outside in the backyard after <laughs> Christmas lunch? Um, yeah, like I can imagine what it'll be like you versus Justin uh, in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, probably a little bit. Justin came in towards the end of my um, sort of end, end of my career. And I must be honest, I was one of the guys that went down to down to talk to his family and talk to Justin to get him to come to, to Eastern Province because he obviously a, a, a talent of like that. He had a number of uh, opportunities to go to any of the other provinces. So I, Kepler sent to me, let's yeah, please go down and chat to Justin. We need him here in the Eastern Cape. So I went down there and chatted to him and his parents and 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 and, and got him to come and play here. So um, yeah, and, and the, the, our family all come from you know the Cathcart Queenstown area. Um, so. And and we, you know, Justin lives in Cape Town now. I live in Port Elizabeth, so we we don't get it together as, as big Christmas parties uh, or any or Christmas gatherings or anything like that. But we're still very close friends. I chatted to him just the other day, um, and that's. Um, but I also got another family member, Cameron Delport, is my first cousin's my first cousin's son as well. So oh, oh, uh, wow. Cameron, okay. yeah, yeah. So Cameron's mom, uh, who's who's passed now a few years ago. Uh, she's my first cousin, so yeah. So Cameron's also very closely related. 
And I know that recently they've been talking about him potentially coming yeah. back uh, and playing uh, at national level as well. Uh, he's made yeah, a name for himself he... in the Caribbean uh, Premier League, especially. Yeah, he's done very well, um, especially in the T20 circuit all around the world. Uh, I know that he, he was playing um, for Leicester, uh, the last I heard, then Essex. And so he's played for a couple of counties as well, uh, played in the Caribbean mm-hmm. League, did well in our in our um, tournament here yeah. last year. Um, so, yeah, it's amazing. These days, you, you know, you can there's opportunities for all types of cricketers. I mean, it's so different to when we played, you know. I mean, I remember going on tour to New Zealand and to Australia and, and and there was a big squad of us and we just had to fit in, you know. One we played one day cricket and and test cricket, you know what I mean? So it was a little bit different to to now. The and these days the guys fly in, you know, there's a there's a T twenty team that flies in and they practice three or four days while the test guys are playing. So it's a totally but different in your time it was all the same team. It was all the same thing. There were there were 14 of us. I think we, in 1994, when we went to Australia, there were, I think there were 14, 15 of us. Uh, there was 11 players and four reserves. That's mm-hmm. the wall. That was when I was playing. And then the guy, the, the funny part about this, the guys that weren't playing were used to be, we used to be the baggage people. So if you weren't, if you didn't get selected, you went to bed that night and the, the team was flying out the next morning. The guys that didn't play had to collect the baggage and pack the bus. <laughs> and they had one manager. <laughs> We, oh, we had one manager, we, and we had a physio, and we had and we had a coach. That was it. <laughs> and uh, we used to pack the bus for the guys that played the, the day before. So, oh, so it was yeah. very different. When I and, uh, went to that, a couple of yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, a couple of months ago, or a couple of years ago, I should say, when uh, we had a it was a function at Arabella, and there were so many guys walking around in tracksuits. Uh, I couldn't keep up. And when I counted them at the function, there was like something like 11 or 12 support staff, you know. So it was, it was actually, it was ridiculous. But but everyone now, you know, they all fulfill different roles and, and it's fully understandable. The game has become so professional. It's frightening. So, Dave, the other thing that and I've learned about this like literally an hour ago, uh, the other uniquity about you specifically, apart from being a double uh, sporting code player, is the fact that you're one of a few players, if not the only South African, to remove a pair of twins, or a pair of brothers, <laughs> I should say, at the international game. You want to talk us through that? Uh, maybe give uh, uh, Khalid's age demographic a bit of education there, <laughs> who those yeah. brothers were. Okay, so, so in 1994, we were in Australia, and um, in 90, well, in 1992, I had, um, I had cancer, if you recall. So... Uh, and I came back and then obviously on all these tours and stuff. And, and in 1994, I was sitting um, um, in Australia. I can't remember if it was in Melbourne or where it was. And we were sitting, we were watching this show on, on, on Australian TV. And um, Tony Gregg was on there. And it was like a talk show come sort of question and answer. And Tony Gregg came up with this was uh, with this sort of, uh, he asked a question to this other team. He said, there's one player in the South African side that go, got both Wall brothers out with one ball. And um, everybody like sort of thought, cheapers, um, you know, what is that all about? And, um, and um, I, I like thought to myself, I wonder who that is. And then I realized because I had testicular cancer and I had one testicle, testicle removed, okay, he was talking about me. So in Australia, I've got both war brothers out with one ball. That's where it comes from. So but it was not really literally like that. But yeah, that's one what ball. I was trying to say. <laughs> but but uh, it's still it's still it's still two uh, significant wickets as well. I mean, if those guys got going, uh, it would be very um, difficult to sort of climb back in the match, as we know from various World Cup encounters against him. What, what was it like touring Australia at the time? I mean, this was one of the initial tours. We spoke to Fani de Villiers a couple of weeks back. He shared his views and experiences. What, what were yours like? It was tough. Um, yeah, look, I think from a mental point of view, it was the, the cricket was obviously brilliant. Um, I loved, you know, I loved playing hot, really hard cricket. And, and, um, and, you know, it was really, really nice to play against tough, tough opposition. Um, the crowd was the, the the people that really they were on your back all the time, you know. And 
Um, it was Australia. You know, so we, we used to put in Australia, yeah, we put some key people down there, guys like Pat Simcox, Farney de Villiers, who, could, who had broad shoulders, you know, we used to put them down there and they, they used to take the flak for, for a lot of us. So it was, it was tough, you know, but um, it was good cricket, you know, and um, it was also mental stuff. There was no, um, and I try and explain to these when I'm, when uh, some players of today, I try and explain to people it wasn't, they weren't swearing at us or, or being, you know, too personal or anything like that. They, you know, they were standing in the slips and they would say things like, oh, guys, he's, he's playing across the line. His bat's coming from gully. Oh, hang on, hang on. I told you he's, he's going to get LBW soon. He's, he's going, playing across the line. And then you start, in your mind, you start thinking, jeepers, am I playing across the line? Maybe, you know, especially when you've got guys behind you like <laughs> Warren and Hayden and uh, Steve War and Mark War and Ian, Ian Healy all standing behind the stumps. And, you know, they, they're playing with your mind. All and the they could all chirp. All yeah, of them could talk, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was tough. It was really, really tough. But uh, it was it was really, really enjoyable. And I, and I you know, as a youngster, I had a, a, friends of, a friend of mine that was uh, immigrated and went over there. And um, we used to, as kids, get these videos of the World Series, you know. And we, suddenly now we were playing in this World Series. And that was like major, you know, really, really major. And, and Tony Gregg afterwards, and that, that game that you were talking about, specifically talking about where I got both of all brothers out uh, with one ball or with two consecutive balls. Um, I, I was actually, we had to win both those games. Uh, we were, we'd done, we'd done quite well and we had to beat Australia on the Saturday and New Zealand on the Sunday to go through to the final of the world series as such. And um, yeah. And we, as I said, we, we were able to beat Australia on the Saturday and then obviously uh, New Zealand on the Sunday, and we went through. We we got ourselves through to the final, and it was a tipping point of our whole tour then because Kepler just got injured. Uh, he broke his hand in 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 uh, Sydney in the Test match, and uh, Hansi had taken over, and there was a, like a bit of a re- um, a new lease of life in the team because obviously you know it always happens. New leader, uh, the guys were keen, uh, and um, yeah, it, it was. It, it was a, a really good time to, to be involved in South African cricket. No, absolutely. And um, I think one of the the, the talky points about uh, you specifically, Dave, is coming back uh, from uh, after being diagnosed with testicular cancer and uh, a little over a year or two afterwards, coming back and scoring that massive 169 against New Zealand. Uh, to talk us through... Your recovery, I mean, what was your thoughts process uh, during the time? Did you think you were going to have an international career uh, thereafter? Yeah, look, we, we went in, in 1991 when I was diagnosed. We weren't in international cricket um, at, at yet. Um, and then what happened was during that season, I, um, yeah, during that season, I obviously couldn't play. And I came back towards the end of the season. And when I was diagnosed, one of the things that I wanted to do is just towards the end of that season is just to play one, you know, one or two games for Eastern Province again. And I, and I was lucky enough to do that. Um, I, I was diagnosed in September and um, it was around about February, March when the one day is with us, but they call Benson Hedges and that type of thing were on. I was able to come back and, um, and I played a, a few games against, uh, against I think it was the, uh, my comeback game. Yeah, at St George's was against the um, Gauteng side, the, the Transvaal side in those days, and um, yeah, I was able to, I think in my comeback game get 65, and uh, everybody thought that I was, um, you know, really fit and 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 back to form again. So they picked me for a um, a four-day game as well. It was a Curry Cup final, which we won, but um, I didn't succeed. Didn't get any runs. It was four days. Just after a, a bout of um, chemotherapy was uh, pretty daunting, I must say. Right, um, quite, uh, it was difficult, to put it that way. Um, and then I, I then went overseas, and the player went. I went over to go and play for Rochdale again because I felt that um, getting some cricket and, and some time in the middle would be the, the best thing for me. So we went back to 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 play for a club called Rochdale in the Lancashire Leagues, and um, yeah. And then I, when I came back. Um, the whole season started, and um, yeah, it was 
I, I started, I, I battled to get into the EP side, can you believe it, to start off with. And I didn't play in the first four-day game because Kepler had this view that the, the guys that played at the end of last year and they were fully fit, fully, fully fit would get first first bite. Um, mm. So I, I, I sat out the first one or two, three, four-day games um, and then suddenly made the, then got back into the team. And, and you know, let me... You know how sport is. Sport is, is 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 a game changer. It's all about opportunities. And um, I wasn't playing in the four day game. And I then got went with the Eastern Province B side. And I went and I think it was against the Tal at Peter Mansburg. And I got a hundred for the for the for the B side. Then, a week later, I got picked for um, for the EP side, the EP Jumbos, as you meant, mentioned in those days. When those days were, I think it was just the EP side. And I got two hundreds against Transvaal, um, or a hundred against Transvaal, if I remember. Yeah. So I got two hundreds in a row. Okay. And a week later, I was selected for for South Africa to play against India in um, in those Benson Hedges game when India came out after we went there in 1992. So within two year, within two weeks or three weeks. Kapil Dev's team, I think. Yeah, that's right. So from within two. Two weeks, I basically went from playing for Eastern Province B playing to playing for South Africa. And that's why I want to say to, to, to the youngsters of today, it's all about opportunities. You need to create those opportunities for yourself. And when you do get them, try and make the best of it because those opportunities don't always come around um, you know, too often, especially in sport when there's so many good players around. Awesome. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Kali just now, but I just wanted to say to you that we got some warm messages and tributes uh, from the likes of James King, uh, from uh, from uh, of course Craig Barrio. I mentioned him to you earlier. Uh, yeah, they all send their regards to you and your family, of course, in the Easter Cape. Uh, Khalid, do you perhaps have any questions from your side? Yeah. So obviously, you spoke about um, you obviously being a, great, a good bowler and a good batsman. Obviously, all rounders in that generation. There were so many to pick from and there's so much competition for the likes of you and other all-rounders, of course, coming through the system. We obviously know about the great Jock Callister as well, who just went into the yeah. ICC Hall of Fame, etc. At the moment, there's a, there's a consensus that South Africa, we're struggling to, to bring these all-rounders through the system. But what do you think made a, that generation so special with such an abundance of all-rounders? How do we repeat that again? Yeah, I think... Uh... Yeah, it's a tough question. I, 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 I just don't think sometimes we give our all-rounders uh, enough time to settle down um, and, and, to, and to perform as all-rounders. And what we try and do is we look for too, we look for too many specialists. Okay, so um, we, and when I say that, um, if he can't bat and bowl like Shark Cullis, then he's not good enough. You know, that's the sort of that's the sort of approach that we have. Whereas I think I think what we could do. And, and we have had some some good ones, um, you know, but but they haven't been as good as Jacques with the ball, or they haven't been as good as Jacques with the bat, and and that's um, that's concerning for me because we we do have some guru around us that are that are in the system, and I mean I'm I'm talking, you know, you look at Sean Pollock, um, I mean he was the sort of like the last best one that we had, um, but I mean Ryan McLaren, um, Chris Morris. These type of guys, they, they, they're not the worst. Eh? I mean, they are, they, Dwayne they are really good. Dwayne Pretorius, um, who's now the, of, of late. But every time he comes on, then they start questioning his ability with a bat or they mm. start questioning his ability with a ball. And I think guys like that need to be given a little bit of time. You know, they when they're going to the nets, they pray, they're practicing their batting and their bowling. And obviously, uh, and these days in crickets, you know, you have to be, you have to be good at all three. You can't just be a. I mean, you remember the old days? You could have a batter who, who, who opened the batting, but he fielded a third man most of the time, or he fielded in the slips and then sort of came out the slips and drifted around the field. Um, you know, these days you have to have. Uh, you have to be good at all three, and um, and if if you're not good at all three, you have to be bloody good at two. So uh, that that's what makes a composition of a side these days. You have to have one or two all rounders. But I just don't feel we give our all. Sometimes we don't just don't give our all rounders enough opportunity to settle in. We're always looking for the next best one, you know, to come along. 
Yeah, because I mean, I like to when I when I have an opportunity to speak to a legend of the game, it's, it's uh, I'm always looking forward and how we can improve it and what we can take from that generation and bring it over into this generation. We heard about what Fanny told us about swing bowling and t- spending your time with a bowler and talking to them about the way you're going to swing the ball, how you hold the seam, putting the emphasis on those type of small little details that can take a bowler to the next level. Um, with regards to that, I mean, I look at your first class record, of course, and 1800s, um, 3750s. I mean, you were good in the longer format as well. It's not like you only were good at ODI cricket, for example, or 50 over cricket. Yeah. Um, so with regards to that, and obviously in South African cricket at the moment, we, we're trying to rebuild our test side. Um, there's a lot of talk about now the current domestic scene at the moment is also in re- uh, in a generation phase or a revolution at the moment with all the experienced players have left. Um, and now we have a lot of youngsters that are going to be competing against each other in, and are going to have to be seen as in the sides. Um, if you look at the, the average age across all the, the, the first class game, um, first class teams at the moment, it's all about 25 years old. So it's, it's not like they have a lot of experience in the sides, but, what was what did you guys do to to increase the level of your longer format cricket so that we can still keep that format alive in this country? Yeah, I think I think we had a different approach. I think um, uh, the ultimate was for for me. Okay, and and, and I'm, I'm probably talking on, on on my on my on my side. The ultimate was to play for South Africa Test cricket. Okay, uh, and also to represent Eastern Province in four-day cricket so um and we we had we needed to spend time at the crease and learn and obviously when a guy like kepler came along um you know we watched him and we learned from him how to to occupy the crease how to wear the bowler down and then obviously take advantage a little bit later in the innings so we had i I don't know if the the guys of today the youngsters of today or that i mean they all talk about playing test cricket is the ultimate but if you realize somewhere along the line that you're not going to play test cricket, then you, the best that you're going to play is, 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 is 50 over cricket or you're going to make a name in T20. So you naturally be, become a bit more adventurous. You play more shots. And it's very difficult to go and play four-day cricket after that and then try and pull in the reins and say, well, now I have to now – bat for for two hours because that's not in your makeup your your makeup is to score quickly so because it's made the the game entertaining no doubt about it um and many of the four day games that we have domestically and test cricket these days doesn't they don't last the the full length of or, you know of, of of either four days or, or or five days so it has become a little bit more entertaining um but sometimes i just don't i i, I do believe it hasn't um some guys just don't know how to occupy the crease for a length of yeah. time and wear down the violence. Um So, yeah, the, I think just its attitude. I think the attitudes have changed over the over the years. Mm. And you mentioned um, Kepler a lot in some of the answers that you've given. Can you give us some insights into what type of captain he was, what type of person he was, etc., and what it was like to play with him and under him, etc.? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, he, was a tough, he was a tough man, eh? um, and he was the right person. I mean, you take, for instance, uh, the Eastern Province side, and I, I started in straight after I left school in 1983-94 season. I, I moved into the EP side. It was a, it was a, it was Graham Pollock had just left and gone to, to Transvaal. So we, there were still some really good players in in EP. And, um, yeah, we, I mean, we, we it wasn't professional like it was now. And, and yeah, it, yeah, we went away. We were competitive at times. Um, but then, obviously, when guy like Kepler came along and he and we'd been in isolation for for 26 years or whatever it was, um, and suddenly Kepler's come along and brought all these training methods from from Australia to to Eastern Province, um, and we started to 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 learn from him, train than him. I mean, we I can't tell you how many laps that I did around St George's Park or or how many times I ran through St George's Park. I mean, I had a knee replacement nine months ago and I blame it on Kepler, you know, because I, I don't think we did so much running in my life, you know. And it, it was a curry thought. cup, Dave, now. Come now, let's be honest. It was a curry <laughs> cup that did that. <laughs> no, look, it was tough, man. It was really tough. With, and, and But he was a hard guy, you know. And I I mean, I'll, I'll give you one story just to mention how tough he was. In 1995, um, he broke, uh, Sean Pollock broke his hand. Sean, when he first came on the scene, had a really, really quick bouncer. 
okay? And at St. George's, broke his hand. We got selected and went off to New Zealand, and a month later, we were back in PE. And our first game back was against Natal with Marshall, Sean Pollock, um, I, I can't think of the, the other bowlers, Gary, I, you know, the, all in the, the, would put it through, the, the, those were the two main guys, and they, they were pretty sharp. And um, Kepler had pins put in his hand while we were away. And when he came back, um, when we came back from overseas, um, I arrived at practice, and he was there. And I said to him, but Kepler, you know, you've only had your pins in for about five, five weeks and that. He said, no, no, I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. I said to him, you know, you can't, you can't be serious. He said, yeah, I'm going in tomorrow morning to have the op to take the pins out. Uh, the plate out, and I'm playing tomorrow evening. I said, no, you can't be serious. He said, I am. <laughs> and he played. And during the game, he was batting, and I kept on walking down the wicket, wicket, you know, down to, down to the wicket, in the middle of the wicket. And um, every time I walked to the middle of the, wi- middle of the wicket, I looked at his palm of his hand, and there was blood in his hand. And I kept to saying to him, Kepler, it's bleeding. He said, yeah, I know it is. But let's not let the opposition know. Let's carry on batting. So, you know, that's how he was. He was a a tough man. And he was the right person at the right time because we needed somewhere, even with the South African setup at that stage, um, to take people into international cricket. um, He was the right person. Um, And then obviously Hansi came along and, you know, everyone has their time. And and Hansi was a great captain. Don't get me wrong. I, 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 I played some really good cricket with him. And he was the guy that gave me that opportunity to, to open the batting, you know, for South Africa after spending 29 to 24, 25 innings is batting in the middle order, hoping to get an opportunity. And mm-hmm. uh, Hansi was the one that came to me the night before New Zealand and said, listen, how, how do you feel like opening? How do you feel? A, how do you feel? feel if you uh, would like to open the batting, how, how, would, how would you go? I said, no, I'd, I'd, love, to, I'd love the opportunity. So, um, yeah, that's, that, he was the one that gave me the opportunity. Mm. So back to you, Ravi. I'm going to let you ask, ask, ask awesome. the last few questions. I don't know if there's any questions from the fans. And I'm saying this. I'm being from, uh, just uh, uh, premeditating this. I think my battery's about to die. But are there perhaps <laughs> any questions from the fans there, maybe? I don't know if you could whip them out. Yeah, not, not at this moment. There's, just, there's, a lot of, there's not a, no questions from the fan at this moment. Okay. So I can tell you one thing. I, I watched South Africa and Australia play at Newlands. This was in 2000. And I was looking forward to that match. Largely because it was labeled as Dave Callahan's comeback. Um, I remember that because uh, there was a massive break between your last innings with South Africa. I think it was about a six-year period. And uh, you yes. happened to play at Newlands. And unfortunately, and unfortunately, I say that with due respect, unfortunately, Australia got uh, on top of us quite extensively. I think we got skittled yeah. out for 140. Uh, what were the yeah. emotions like you coming back and, and playing under... Um, under Hansi, under uh, a sort of a new uh, team at that point in time. Actually, I'm not sure if it's Hansi. I think you might be playing under Sean at that time. I'm, I may be mistaken. That was Sean. Yeah, no, it was Sean. Actually, yeah. that was the that was the series where Hansi withdrew from the side, and um, it was a it was just over a five year period from my last game to that game. And Hansi had just withdrawn or had to withdraw because of the mat that match fixing saga, and. Um, I was I actually phoned Hansi. Can you believe this? I phoned Hansi on the Sunday night to, to find out what was going on. You know, like I, I'd seen the news, and this was like traumatic for me because, you know, I didn't think that this would ever happen within the the, the structures that we were playing in and involved in. Right. And I look, I understand I hadn't been there for five years, so I don't know really what happened. So I phoned Hansi, and Hansi just said to me, "Dave, I can't talk to you. I think my phone's been tapped." Um, but um, sure. please, give me a ring. We'll have a beer one day. Anyway, the next morning, I was driving to – I had the sports shop at St. George's, the cricket ground. And the next morning um, – cheers, Ravi. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. so the, next, the, the next morning, I was driving to, to the ground um, where my sports shop was, and I got a phone call from Dave Emsley, who was, who was uh, heading up um, EP Cricket. And he said, where are you? I said, well, I'm parked in the car. In the car park outside, he said, "Listen, I think you need to pack your bags and 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 uh, they they need you in um, they need you in, in Durban." So off I off I went home, raced home, phoned, phoned my family, phoned uh, my wife. Everyone got 
got home, packed everything, and then shot down to the airport, and then and then obviously flew out to Durban to meet the team. Um, and it was a different side, if you think about mm. it. Um, you know, from the the team that I was involved now, the team that was only think the only one really was there was Gary Kirsten, was the, one of the older guys that was still within the team. But the rest were all young guys: Boucher, Callis, uh, Gibbs, um, you know, Klusner, uh, mm. Makaya. Um, so it was a totally different side to 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 when I was playing five years ago. So yeah, it was a it was great. Um, unfortunately, it was very short lived. It was I mean I was already 36 when I made my comeback to international cricket, and it was just because I had one unbelievable season in in in, in 2000. Yeah. So I'm just going to apologize for Ravi because obviously with the load shedding, his phone yeah. died. He didn't expect him to last that long. So I'm going to continue this with our team for now. Um, so I'm t- talking about that. You spoke about that. The Obviously, the whole match fixing scandal. How hard did that rock you guys as as teammates of, of Ansi, etc.? And um, in, how do you did you guys move on from that? I mean, obviously, we had a lot of success after that. Yeah, look, I remember. I remember arriving in 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 Durban, and and the team was really shaken up. Um, and it was it was it was. I mean, so I think we 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 played that first game um, in Durban, and we won actually. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that was that game was we basically the side was played in emotions. Um, really, I mean, the guys tried really hard, and there was a lot going off the field. And I think everybody was just happy to be on the cricket field to, and get away from, you know, the, the press, the media, uh, people wanting to know what the story was all about. So it was good to be on the cricket field and be together. So I think that there was a lot of emotion on that field for the first day, for the first game after after this whole saga. And then obviously we came down to Cape Town, and uh, and and we lost that game, um, and it, with a poor performance. And to be honest with you, I, I can't recall what actually happened. I don't know. We did. We went. We went to Joburg and we and we won that game as well. So we won the series two one. But um, and then after that, I wasn't really involved. So you know, I, I never really knew what actually tr- happened. So it's very difficult for me to actually say. I, um, mm. I've sort of heard stories, um, and, and and I obviously listened to the Truth Commission and all that type of thing. But it 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 was. It was a sad time for South African cricket because yeah. some some good people got um, got hurt in that in that whole saga. Yeah, on the flip side of the coin, of course, Hansi was one of the greatest captains, and a lot of people would say so. And you you would know that more than anybody else. Can you maybe give us some insights into what made him such a special captain? What made him stand out from so many others? I think look at Hansi led by example, uh, and that was uh, on the field uh, and off the field. Um, I recall being playing Lancashire League cricket and he was playing for a nearby club uh, called Norden while I was at, at Rochdale. And often he used to phone me up and say, Dave, come, let's get, do some running. Let's get, do some training. We've got a big season coming. So he used to pull in all his, all, all, his, all the people in the, his whole team, he used to pull them in. And what, I think one of the most important things about Hansi, he made everyone in the team feel important. Um, mm. And they had a role to play in this team, and that I think to me was one of the one of the big one of the biggest attributes that 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 Hansi had. He always made you f- feel part of the team. Um, you know, if he saw you on the side and 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 you weren't quite, you remember you live basically travel for four or five months at a time together. So, um, and if you ever felt like you weren't performing. He would know, and he would come, and he would chat to you, and he'd make you still feel part, even though you were twelfth man, or you was you were still doing a job for the side, you know. And I think that was one of the things. And Hansi um, was fun, you know. He, he, he although he worked really hard, he had, you, you know, he was a practical joker off the field um, in the change room. He was always up to jokes, make, you know, making everybody laugh as well. Um, but when it came down, obviously, to to playing cricket and and some of the serious stuff. He was as serious as as anybody else could be. Yeah, because I mean that's like that's three completely different captains. It's obviously someone like Kepler Vessels, who you talk about, so it's quite a tough man. Yeah. Then it's someone like Hansi that's led by example. And then you got someone like Sean Pollock, who seems like he's um, a lot more like he, I think people consider him as the nice guy. But what was he like as a as, as a as a type of leader um, from your perspective? If you if, when you witnessed him. 
Yeah, I think the thing is with Sean, um, his approach, um, and, I, and and I don't think he go, I don't think he meant it. I think he, he was as, as as serious as as everyone, anybody else. But just his just his approach, it's just a little bit more. Um, how can I call it? A little bit more relaxed. Um, mm. He's na- he's been a relaxed type nature. His nature, you know? yeah. So, <laughs> it, it just comes from your nature, you know, and you, you can't help that. It's very difficult to to change your nature because you know you're the captain and 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 look at i think he was a really good captain unfortunately with that 2000 was it 2003 with that whole saga in yeah. against sri lanka yeah, down yeah. in durban you know the, the poor guy was uh, you know the, you can't put all the blame on him they were on the, er, there was management there was scorers there were a lot of people involved with that whole thing so it was very difficult to to, to say to him it was his fault and you know, when you got guys like Shark Callis in, in, in the team and, and Lance Clues there, these are all winners. Um, and having a, a guy like Sean, um, I know it wasn't wasn't the end of the world. It was just that yeah. he he made a big mistake, <laughs> which which, which <laughs> uh, in two thousand and three, yeah. and everybody and everybody blamed him. But uh, there's yeah. a lot of people in the back in 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 the you know in the back room that should also take the blame for that. Yeah, um, you obviously mentioned also playing with some youngsters coming through the system, some guys like Herschel Gibbs and guys like McIntyre and Jacques Callas. Um, as a as youngsters that they were coming into the side, what 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 stood out to them? Of um, what stood up stood out about them? Did you instantly just know when you first saw them in the in their first net? Obviously, you would have seen them obviously domestically as well, but when you saw them play for the first time, did you just know? Did it just click? Now, look, you can see. I mean, you, you can see talent when there's talent, you know what I mean? You know, um, you hear about these youngsters that come through our schooling system. Um, so when these boys come through, the yeah. young, young yeah. cricketers of today, when they start coming through the system, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you hear, you hear about them and, um, you know, it just, they come into the, they, they come into the first class system yeah. and they just start doing, you know, doing well. Um, yeah, you know, the funny story with with I, I remember in two thousand in, in nineteen ninety five, um, I was uh, I was playing it for Rochdale. I just got that one six nine, and I I felt wow. that that um, that I you know I had a sorry about that. Um, no, I, fine. I felt that uh, you know the dogs in the back you know, going crazy. <laughs> um, I I just felt that uh, you know I I just made myself feel at home in in the international scene. Um, I. I and um, I went off to to, to Rochdale, and um, I got a call. I remember I've never forgotten it from Ali Bacher to tell me that um, Dave, I'm sorry, um, we are um, we're going to go with the youth policy, and and we're not going to give you a contract for this coming season. Sure. And uh, cheap as I was devastated. I, I I remember thinking to myself, you know, I've just got the South African record, 169, not out. Uh, third highest score ever in international cricket or fourth highest score ever in international cricket. Yeah. You know, this is unfair, uh, all these type of things. And eventually I asked him the question. I said to him, by the way, um, who are you signing up? You know, who's the next all-rounder that you're going to be signing up? You know, because, I mean, I battled with Hans. Uh, Hans, he was in the team before that, was uh, with, with uh, Kaper, Macmillan. Mm. And, and, and now suddenly I felt like I had this opportunity. And he said, no, no, Dave, we've, We've decided to sign a young guy by the name of Jacques Callis as a, as the next all-rounder, and uh, we think we're going to, you know, start blooding these guys. And well, I thought to myself, yeah, can you? Be- I mean, this is unfair, and all this type of thing. Well, you know, the other day when he was uh, voted the hall- in the RCC Hall of Fame, <laughs> I was well, not such a bad guy, not such a bad player to take my place. <laughs> 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 of course. And I remember watching the first few games, thinking, "Yeah, there we go." He didn't even make runs, and you know, and 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 I'm not. I actually said this to Jacques a few years ago. We were sitting in a golf cart together, and I said to him, "You know, Jacques, when you got selected, eh? yeah, you know, I was pissed off." <laughs> 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 uh, well, a few, How do you? You many years. Uh, what another twenty years later, you got invited into the Hall of Fame, so he, he deserved it. Yeah. Yeah, how do you bounce back from something like that? I mean, two youngsters, there's a lot of guys that face that in the in the team, you know, when yeah, so there'll be a lot of players that will face that in the team. Yeah, look at as I said to you earlier in the in the, in the chat, uh, 
you know, cricket's all about opportunities, how you take them. Um, yeah. And you know what? This game has been around for years, and I, and it's bigger than any individual, any administrator. And uh, we had to look after the game. You know what I mean? And 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 and, and you know, obviously talk about it and, and encourage youngsters to play. Because there's so many life lessons uh, in cricket, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, you know, I'm in the working in working environment now, and I always tell people, just think of this. Um, when I when I phone somebody and try and sell somebody something to someone, and I get uh, rejected on the telephone, it's like getting a note, okay? And when you do it the second time, it's like getting another note. You know what I mean? And then eventually, when when you get through and you get you, you succeed with a with, with you know obviously being a salesperson and you succeed it it's like getting a hundred and I've been through yeah. this many times before when I've got many ducks and when I walk to the wicket the next day or the a day later I'm my walk to the wicket is not as quick as it was before I got that duck so and if I get two ducks in a row I walk very slowly to that wicket because I'm very nervous that I'm going to get another duck. So it's exactly <laughs> the same thing, you know. So, yeah. so uh, and when you get a hundred, um, and you come out the tunnel and you're going to the wickets, you flip up your knees, uh, flip up your ankles, and you swing the bat around, and you like you're going to dominate this because you've just come for a hundred, you know. And who knows? First ball, you can get, you can nick off and get out again. So. Oh, awesome. Look, it's, it's a, it, there's so many life lessons in cricket. Yeah, so I'm going to end off just with one, two, two questions from a fan. And that one yeah, is sure. after you, you scored a tremendous 169 without the Mandela Cup, as you spoke about before. Name a few of your yeah. fondest memories on the course of your protest career. Yeah, look, I think the ultimate of my protest career would have to be the 169. Uh, that's that was that has to be a, from a personal uh, from a personal note, um, and then just getting the opportunity. I think the next would be just getting the opportunity to wear the purchase um, uh, the purchase badge and play for your country. I think that is for me was uh, massive, you know, and and especially a year after I had been diagnosed with cancer, it was basically mm -hmm. almost a year to the day that when I'd been diagnosed and then made my debut a year later. So. Um, you know, the, just those emotions of walking onto the field and walking to the to to the middle of the wicket, and I mean, there was crowds like you can't believe. I mean, the, the, I, I try and explain it to my son sometimes. You know, the the type of crowds that we used to have just for domestic cricket, and he mm. and he can't believe it. You know, so there was a lot of emotion in, in every game that that I played. You know, and I always played uh, every game as if it was my last, because. Uh, there were some good players around, as I mentioned earlier. You know, Brian McMillan's, Adrian Capers, um, the guys like uh, Hansi Cronier. So there were some good all-rounders in, in the team, and they all they, they all wanted to to represent South Africa. So it was tough. Um, but uh, yeah, and then I think the, the other one was obviously uh, the, the game that I spoke about early on uh, in Australia against Australia when I got. Um, both War Brothers out. I think I got three for 26. I got a run out and I got a few runs on the board as well. And I got uh, I got given the man of the match by Tony Gregg, which is um, yeah, behind me on my, on one of my shelves, um, which is, which is um, you know, one of those things that I watched as a kid on TV or on, on videotapes. And suddenly here I am being interviewed by Tony Gregg and winning the man, yeah. man of the match in a, in a World Series game. You know? wow. But yeah, other than that, there are many highlights, you know, playing for – Playing for Epsom Province, winning the Curry Cup in in, in 88, uh, 89 season, which was the centenary of South African cricket, uh, that was a massive highlight from a team perspective. Um, and then obviously playing in such a successful Eastern Province side was um, was great. Yeah. And the last one is just a funniest on-field memory for you. And I, I know you must have been involved in quite a few. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, look, yeah, there were there were, there were quite a few, uh, and I'll finish off on this one. Um, we were playing. Um, it was just, we were all coming. Just yeah, around about the time I was making my comeback, um, and there was a the game. Um, it, South Africa. It was the opening of the Free State st Stadium, um, and um, I. Um, I was selected a late selection. I had to take Brian McMillan's position out. And if you know Brian McMillan, the size of Brian McMillan and, and the size of myself, um, 
I had to wear his clothes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I couldn't change, I couldn't change the, the clothing before the game. And um, I was chasing a ball down to the boundary. And I went into a slide and then suddenly I got a started feeling that I was getting a grass burn. So I stuck my studs into the ground and I went, I flipped over onto my stomach and I, and I slid straight over the boundary rope. And the ball was still trick. I missed the ball, but the ball was still trickling towards the boundary. And I was desperate to save, um, save the boundary. But when I was lying on the other side of the boundary rope, I'd realized that my pants had slipped right <laughs> off. Okay. And they were around my ankle. Okay. And I only had a jock strap on. So I had to get, I was now weighing up, should I try and save the four or should I just lie and put up that I, you know, as a sportsman, you're also competitive. So guess what? Yeah. I stood up with my jock strap on, with my pants around my ankles, jumped over the rope, picked the ball up and threw it back to the boundary. So, uh, you know, I, I, I still get dragged by some of the pre state guys. Um, you know that uh, that played in that game, and uh, yeah, a lot of the lot of the, the I think it was a South African invitational side, so it was quite. Uh, but yeah, there's <laughs> lots of stories. I, I, yeah. I, if I finish off with one really good one, um, I recall playing uh, when I made a comeback, and um, I was playing in a in, in that Curry Cup final um, against Northern Transvaal at in Pretoria at Centurion. And um, in my comeback, before I actually sort of really played the 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 Ben Edges game, I played mm. in a in a four day game in the B side, and I got a naught. I was out. Can you believe it? My first game back after a uh, four day game after having cancer, um, I was out at the non strikers end without facing a ball. No. <laughs> so uh, Gavin Victor. Gavin Victor hit the ball back, had hit hit Gebran Kropler's hand and went onto the stops, and I was out yeah. without facing a delivery. So then the following weekend was the Carry Cup final. It was in, as I said to you, uh, in between that we had that Benson Hedges game, um, which I made 65 against Transvaal, and then the following we go up to to go and play in the Carry Cup final. The EP players who were representing South Africa at that stage were obviously Kepler, Dave Richardson, and Mark Rashmir, and they were all overseas. Um, it's been selected, and they were all overseas at the, at the World Cup. Okay, so now they select me. So I go up for this game, and after the game, uh, we win the Curry Cup. But during the game, I got caught at third slip by Sylvester Clark for uh, for naught, and then uh, we had about 20 runs to go, and Mike Hazeman came on, and I and I hooked one straight down mid wicket's throat for naught with 20 runs to go. So in four day cricket, I actually had got three noughts in a row. So now <laughs> afterwards, now we're sitting in this massive bath they have in Pretoria and the champagne's going and we all, and I um, all having a lot of fun and, uh, and, and talking about the season and that, and we got this, um, we had a player by the name of Louis Kuhn, who is mm-hmm. um, a very good friend of mine and uh, he plays for Boylant as well. He just arrived in PE. It was his first season. Season, and um, while we were celebrating and having a lot of fun, he said, "Mana, mana," and we all look at Louis because he didn't say a hell of a lot in his first year. And we all look at him, and he said, "Ons moet die here dank dat kelle de samen ons vanaf." And chief was quite a serious comment to make in the in the in the bar, you know, like. Yeah. And we all looked around. Everyone looked around, and then we, like you have in any team, you have a practical joker. And uh, Rudy Bryson was at that stage our joker, and he turned around to Louis and he said, "Louis, Kellers better ask the Lord for some runs very quickly, otherwise he's not going to be with us for much longer." No, we had a we 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 had a really good side in those days, and uh, we had a mm. lot of fun as well. So off, off, yeah. off the field and on the field. So this. Two more things. Just one, just a message. Obviously, with all the turmoil that's happening in South African cricket at the moment, just a message to the fans and how they stay positive going forward. Or what is your advice to us as fans out there? Yeah, look at this. Yeah, it hasn't been good. Um, I, I must admit. Um, and um, and I just hope that, uh, as I said to you earlier on, um, this game's going to be around for a long time. Um, and um, it, it's, you know, it, it'll always be here. 
So, and I'm sure somewhere along the line, this will all uh, blow past um, and, and we'll get back to playing cricket. I just think during the, this whole bra uh, lockdown period, too many people have had too much time to think and try and, and, and we need to get back onto the cricket field again and start attracting those crowds back uh, and the interest back. Um, so I just hope that the, the people out there stay patient. You know, it's a wonderful game. As I said to you, it's got wonderful life lessons in. So if you are a father uh, or a parent, uh, that, um, that um, in please encourage your kids to continue playing. They don't have to continue playing for the all their lives. They don't all have to become professionals. But it's a wonderful game to uh, with a lot of life lessons. And I just hope parents um, keep, um, you know, encouraging their kids to play cricket um, because uh, – it 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 it's a great game. Yeah. Is there anything in any personal projects that you'd like to punt on the platform to in, if you if you'd like give you the opportunity? <laughs> no, okay. I, a cricket for me is um, I'd like yeah. I just like to say I mean I'm, I'm still he heavily involved. Uh, we had a great time. Um, a the few 50s of us. Um, mm. Yeah, Ravi Ravi said in the fifty in the over fifties World Cup. So. You know, these are the type of things that um, that that keep you going. And I, you know, I'm still on the EP cricket in the, the, as a board member. I still okay. as uh, vice chairman of Old Grey Cricket Club. Um, I still help out at the university um, with their cricket uh, after spending seven seven or eight years with with Grey High School as well. And um, yeah, and now I'm working for Mercantile Bank, so uh, and doing business banking. So I've got quite a busy schedule. Um, yeah. And my wife's got an embroidery business called Embroidery Forever. So, yeah, I'm I'm very busy, but um, I'm very grateful for the opportunities that that, uh, that cricket has provided for me. So thanks a lot, Dave, for coming on the show. I really enjoyed talking to you. I'm sorry about the interruption with Ravi leaving, but um, thanks a lot for giving us opportunity to catch up with you and learn about your stories. Yeah, listen, thanks very much. I enjoyed it. Um, I love talk, talking about cricket and talking about the past. And uh, keep up your good work because uh, we need to spread the game and, and you've got a wonderful show. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll speak to you again soon. Cheers, thank you. See you. So, guys, that's all we have for you today on the show. Thank you very much for watching and tuning in. Sorry about the interruption with Ravi losing his battery. Of course, we know that all the problems with regards to lockdown and with regards to ESCOM, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't want to be slating anybody over there with regards to that. Thanks a lot for watching the show. Obviously, don't forget to click like, comment, share, subscribe. We want you to know what you guys think about certain things. We want your comments in the comment section because this is a platform for you to express your feelings and what you think about. We need you guys to share it, obviously, with your friends and family so we can grow. Subscribe and click the notification bell so you can get uh, notifications of all uploads of our future obviously all of our future endeavors that we do with regards to the magazine download the latest issue of the magazine we've got two issues available for you all you have to do is subscribe it's free so i don't know why you don't go on and just go and subscribe to it um the next issue will be on the first monday of every month that's how we're going to be published it. so thank you a lot for everybody for tuning in and we will see you guys again very very soon cheers mm -hmm.